just finished this trip and which was very well organized. Every Jewish person should go see what went down during the war. Zakeni legadel, bani muvnei vanim, cha hachomi munevoni. Oi avei Hashem yirei elokim, anche yemes zerakoidesh ba Hashem dveiki. Jay Roots' mission is to try really inspire the Jewish world to try think about what it means to be a Jew, what it, what difference it makes as we learn about our, our past and can our past inform our future. And um, so we're we're delighted to have you here. It's going to be wonderful to be together. I'm delighted to be with you on the bus and hopefully as the week goes on I'll get to know all of you and we'll have an incredible experience that will be truly, truly meaningful. I want you to think afterwards that we are survivors. When it's written in Yiddish, if you ever saw the Yiddish, there's a little dot on the word Yid. It, this is called the Spim Yid. If you would take this back, not to 1939, but let's say to 1839, 100 years before that, there was hardly a thing here. Lodge did not exist as a city. This is a city that literally was built out of emptiness. It was a city built at the end of the 1800s as part and parcel of a vision of Poland changing. And Poland has its ups and downs throughout the ages. Being Middle Europe as such often battles over Poland. And Poland gets divided, gets taken. Alliances, which are basically marriages between different kingdoms and then who takes over, continues to change what Poland would look like. But if we think of Poland from the 900s beginning as a kingdom, in the 1300s, a king called Kazimierz the Great, which we'll learn about in Krakow, 
because that becomes the city, becomes a huge place where things are happening that have never happened before. The Germans, when they will attack in 1939, 1st of September 1939, they will annex Western Poland. And therefore Lodz is one of the cities that is part of the annexed area of, of Germany. Why? Lebensraum, they need living space. And so many ethnic Germans will be brought in from the West to live here in the places where other people have been pushed out of towards the ghetto or even pushed further to the East. They will change the name of the city from Lodz to Litzmannstadt. And the ghetto will be called the Litzmannstadt ghetto. And Jews will be moved into the Litzmannstadt ghetto very, very soon after the war breaks out. Lodge ghetto, there is another thing that comes upon the people that really freaks them out. And that is when the deportations begin. Now try and remember this. The Nazis did not have a plan to exterminate the Jews right at the beginning. It is a process. And I, for me, when I learned that, it was a, almost a shock because in my mind, they murdered six million the Nazis and it must be that that was their plan right from the beginning. Hitler had wanted to get the Jews to immigrate, but no one was prepared to take them. And then when he comes into Poland, there are so many Jews here compared to, to Germany. In Germany, we were less than 2% of the population was Jewish. And here in Poland, 10% was Jewish. 3.3 million Jews out of a total population of 33 million. In Warsaw, one in every three people living in Warsaw was a Jew. 33%. It's more Jewish than New York. They watch a hundred women being shot. Adolf Eichmann gets too close and he gets some blood gets onto his uniform. Heinrich Himmler watches these hundred women get shot and he loses his lunch. And so they decide, you know, this is, this is not a good thing. Because it was efficient. In Babi Yar, which is right outside Kiev, they killed 32,000 Jews in, in less than 30 hours. So out of compassion to the murderers, they say we have to distance them. So in a forest not, not so far from here, 
The experiment, November of 1941. We have an eyewitness testimony, Polish person giving eyewitness testimony to what he saw in that forest. He saw two things. One was a pit that was filled with caustic soda, limestone, that when comes in contact with human body, human flesh, it burns the flesh. And he sees Jews being forced into this pit. And at the same forest, at the same time, he sees, he sees uh, trucks pulling up, and they, they're open, and they dump out the bodies from the back of the trucks. Jews have this discoloration. It's clear that they had been gassed in these trucks. And it's what, what it appears to be is that far as not so about an hour from here was a place where they experimented in different methodologies of how we're going to kill Jews in mass without people having to pull the trigger. This is the camp that you can just write about in history books if you want. But we don't believe in that. We believe in the idea, just as it's mentioned in the Torah, in the over hundred times it's mentioned in the Torah. Our history is not history, but our history is all through Zechira, of remembering. Of remembrance, everything. To understand the people that came here. We have to remember the people who were the victims, and we have to remember the people who actually had to work here. Some of you might have got to see Shimon Zarebnik's testimony on the bus. I don't know. But Shimon Zarebnik, who was one of the people that survived, who arrived here at the age of 13, had to work in this camp. You have seen that famous book of six million Jews. We'll know it's mentioned six, uh, six million times in a book. Because one person after one person after one person. What could they have built? What could they have become? What were their aspirations? Where were their dreams? What could have happened had this place not been built? You'll see these white things. These are bones of our Jewish brethren. Who is in my hand? Is it Moishala? Is it Sarah? Is it Rivka? Is it Solly? Is it Josh? Who's in my hand here? Is it Razel? Who is in my hand? All over the ground, these white little things that look like wood are bones. And we have come here today to close the circle and to say, we haven't forgotten you. We won't forget you. And we're coming to do the right thing. We're going to come and give you a resting place. I can't find your whole body. I'm not like I was there three weeks ago. I was in the town called Brisk, where they found 1,240 skulls. And I stood in front of the pit of 1,240 skulls and bones of Jewish people that were shot dead in the center of the town that they just buried again. So I can't do that, but I can come and pick up your bones, various places that have been scattered around here. And I can do it like I know how to behave in a cemetery. I'm behaving here too, with the utmost respect. upside down like a piano metronome and they would swing them like a pendulum back and forward and then the Nazis gave their kids the gun to see if they could hit the Jews while they swung back and forward. It could happen this way. It might happen like that. But she's screaming, pushes them out of the way, a messer, a messer. And she runs up to a German soldier and she screams, give me a messer. And he thinks, why not? Let's watch this little Jewess kill herself. This will be fun. A good sport. But instead he gives her the knife. She kneels down and she takes out under her coat the bundle. And in her arms are a little Jewish baby. 
and she gives him a Britmila. She circumcised her son so he should die as a Jew. If you're gonna die, die as a Jew. I believe is the message of what our Jewish people are about. We started as Yaakov. Yaakov is a heel. He was underneath Esav. Esav tried to beat him down. And then he struggles and he fights with that Sarshel Esav, which is that angel of death, and he wins. And the name Yisrael is one who struggles and is victorious. The story of the Jewish people is not history, it's not their story, it's our collective memory. 350,000 Jews living here, minimally. The largest outside of, other than New York. <laughs> I, of course, Irene is from Warsaw. 350,001, I meant. And uh, we learn about life, there's not much left here in Warsaw. As opposed to Lodz, where a lot of things are still standing, Warsaw was totally destroyed after the uprising, both the Jewish and Polish uprising. All these buildings here are new. We'll be heading into the ghetto. Nothing is left. From last year, the Maislin family, they introduced me to these wonderful people. And um, the Minsters made an incredibly generous donation to the Living Legacy this year so that we can all be here today. And um, we're, dedicating, we're dedicating our trip this year, our journey, uh, to Annette's parents, Roma, who's alive and well in Toronto, and Jack Buckman, who when you received the notebook, you had a quote from Jack, a little bit about, about the way he lived. So we put that on the notebook so you have something forever. So I want to thank the Minters in front of all of you and recognize their efforts that they made to see the living legacy happen for this year. That's the way it works, one person at a time. But they saw that, and I want to thank them personally. And uh, thank you. My name's Annette Mincer. I come from two Holocaust survivors, mother and a father, both from Poland. For the parents here, I just want to give you a, a little brief snippet of what my grandmother went to, went through. Um, my mother and her sister were being chased by the Germans and my grandmother ended up taking some of her jewelry and bribing a mother superior and my mom and my aunt were hidden in a convent for several months, beaten. The mother superior knew they were Jews, knew they could get away with anything and her older sister would wake up early to change the straw because my mother used to pee in her bed because she was so scared she was only nine years old and she was, her mother walked her to the edge of the forest and said, go into the forest, middle of the night, and follow the light, and that's the convent. So imagine all of you who are mothers sending your little seven-year-old and your 10-year-old into the forest. You don't know if you're ever gonna see them again, but it was the only way to save them. That was my mother's side. My father never spoke about the Holocaust until his later years when he wrote his book and decided he needed to share because you all need to know. And the most important are the non-Jews. So any of your non-Jewish friends, those are the ones that you have to tell the stories to, not us who are descendants of survivors. My father lived in the Warsaw Ghetto with his sister Tamara and anyone who goes to Dr. Bross in Thornhill, that's my first cousin. So this is her grandmother as well. Many of you are her patients. In the ghetto, my grandfather believed that he wasn't so religious, but that Hashem is going to save him. It was my grandmother, her Pola Bachman, who my sister Pauline is made for, named for.
before, she said, we have to leave. They're coming, they're gonna kill us. It was too late. The trains were coming and they were being loaded up on the train. My grandfather threw my father and his sister off the moving train, off a train. Like, you don't know if you've killed your own children. My father and my uh, aunt lived in the forest for a long time at 11 years old. So all of you kids, you are in your 20s. Imagine 11 years old. Think of your sister, especially you boys. You have an older sister. Your sister is being raped by a German. You're 11 years old and you go behind the German and you pull out the gun from his holster and you shoot him because it's either him or your sister. So at 11 years old, you're not thinking about playing hockey or, or, or basketball or going for lunch. You just want to save your sister's life. Miraculously, they end up finding one another. This is a Yeah, this is the wife. So now that she 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 Thank you so much. The poles outside, of course, are getting more than this. They're getting up to 1,600 to 1,800 calories, and the Volker Deutsche, okay, those Germans over here, were getting up to 2,600 calories. They're all outside, they're not in prison. All of them. For you to understand what it means to us to understand this, if we take our 2,000 calories, and we open them up now, and we split, oh dear, excuse me, they're all broken. We split it into a third. Okay, we've got the split into a half, we've got 500, we've now taken up another third, okay? So we're down to how many now, anybody? Around about 600, okay, calories. Now I take this, and I'm going to split this in half again, I'm down to 300, and if I take off another piece, I'm pretty much down to this. 180 calories a day. So till one day, my mother was in the apartment with myself and my little sister and we heard a big knock at the door but my mother didn't want to open she thought uh, maybe they will go away but they didn't they kicked open the door and right away they slept my mother and we started to cry and the German said to my mother why did you open the door so she said you know my little girls are crying they're scared they asked any men around here, so they looked around at the apartment. Thanks God, there was no man. So that time my mother said, thanks God, my sons are not here and my husband. My father was somewhere, I don't remember where. And like I say, it got worse and worse. You know, we stayed in the line and my father, on the one side, the right side, I was behind my father, my mother, the left side, and my sister. So my father had some papers to show, go this way. My mother didn't have anything, this way. Then I also had a little paper, I don't remember what that was, this side, and my little sister, this side. And never saw them again. In the beginning, they said they sending them to war, but that time we didn't know what's happening. They're going straight to the guest chamber. And God for Bridge said, you're gonna get cut. Don't say 
somebody gave you, just tell them. You saw a package, you thought it's some food, so you picked it up. And it was ammunition. So I said, okay, I'll be very careful. I didn't have to wear the, the star of David. I said, I will do it for you. How old were you? That time, 11 years, maybe. 11 years old? Yeah. Okay. Why didn't she want to for the stuff? Yeah. She, she yeah. got out to get the stuff. Yeah. So I said, okay. She gave me a package. And she said, put on, because I was so skinny, put on something loose, so you're going to put it around your stomach. And when I was walking and I saw the Germans, I knew something, you know, I was doing something wrong. And I looked at them as they looked at me and I just kept on walking. And she gave me instructions what to do. As I remember like it would be today. The second floor on the right <laughs> side, she said, knock at the door and get this number, get the package, and don't ask any questions and run back. And that's what I did. And with those, maybe those bullets, they killed two Germans. But by the end, it wasn't so pretty. They built Mila 80. You heard about it, it was a book, Mila 80. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And most of those kids died anyways. And the, before Pisa, some guys, they find a dead horse. So they cut up a piece of the horse and they brought it to cook. But my father was very orthodox. I knew when I tell my father, the horse meat, he said, don't even cook it. But I didn't tell him. And we started to cook the meat and meat and cooked and cooked. And my father was so hungry, said, so when the meat gonna be ready? I said, Dad, it's not ready yet. So he said, it cooks like a horse. <laughs> 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 Teachers all day, it's pouring with rain, it's freezing cold. And he says to his uh, driver, take me to Titus's Arch. He says, Rabbi, are you crazy? It's late, I'll take you there tomorrow. He says, I need you to take me now. And so he goes off to Titus's Arch, and then he stands under Titus's Arch, and this is what he says. Titus, 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 Apupistu, where are you? Oh, I'm standing here. Where are you, the man who came to destroy the Jewish people? Where are you? I'm standing here. I survived and you didn't. Where's the great Roman Empire? It's garnished, it's gone. Look who's still standing here. When you stand in this place over here, you see what you see over here. You cannot but scream out those words. Hitler, Hitler, Abu Bistu, where are you? You thought you could finish us off. But look who's standing here.
Camp, or should I say the first camp to help the second camp? The second camp will be the death camp, the first camp will be the one for the Germans, and everything they need for the second camp. In the second camp, very little will happen. We ourselves will be watching at some stage Sobibor, the story, okay, and then you'll understand that this camp is exactly the same as Sobibor, exactly the same as Palsa. Train wheels going around, and he starts to hum a tune to himself as a chassid of Modjits. Modjits were famous for tunes. He hums the tune to himself, and this is the tune that he hums. was destroyed. And we had the foresight, we meaning my father, to flee from our town. I was wrapped in a maroon duvet. I was short of four years old at that time. And my father carried me into the nearby woods, very similar to what you see here, and very similar to what you see throughout Poland. Woods, forests, forests, etc. And from a distance, we watched as the Wehrmacht were moving through our town. And that image has stayed with me forever. In fact, about 10 years ago, when my family decided that I should do something about my story, I found a photograph taken by a Wehrmacht soldier of that very, very image of the Wehrmacht moving in on their lorries, on their motorcycles, on horseback. And we watched that, and I will never, ever forget that sight. It's engraved in my soul forever. We stayed in the woods for a while. I don't know how long, and as I said, my grandmother decided that she had to go and doubt the doctor them, and we've got to see if we can save somebody. And that was the last we saw of her. And people said, we've got to get going, urged us to get going. Where do we go? We had no means of transportation. We didn't know where to go. But we heard that Jews were going northeast to Bialystok. And we passed the signs of Bialystok many, many times.
So Baruch Hashem, thank God, my grandfather came over in 1939, so I did know him. But he could never imagine that we'd be walking through, following behind the Torah and him, who's really holding the Torah, who's holding it for me, for my children, he's got my grandchildren, all of our generations, that he's coming back after being chased out 70 years ago, 80 years ago, only to return and as we often say, Am Yisrael Chai, that we're still alive, and we know that Eitz Chaim Hila Machazikim Ba. The Jews are alive because though we travel everywhere, we always travel with this. and I was till the uprising was a ghetto. Before, a couple days before, we saw something ter terrible gonna happen and I was still there with my father. So my father had some paper. He's working for the Germans. So we thought he's gonna be safe. So we lived in an apartment. In the ghetto, people didn't have where to stay. So whoever knew us, they came. We had a small apartment that was maybe 50 people in our apartment. Two young girls tried to run away, and they were caught, and they were hanged. And every, every body had to come out from the barracks and to watch. I remember I turned my head, I couldn't look. So the German with the cane, I should watch two young girls. And before they were already killed, I asked them, if we let you free, what would you do? They said, we'll run away again. And so I told them. When you look at a person's shoes, you need to think about what are the dreams and the aspirations of this person. And the question that you have to ask yourself all the time, as I said on day number one, is am I able to fill the shoes? Am I able to fill the shoes? What happened? We had no toilet, we had a hole there. Yeah. Where was we the hole? No, yeah. When we arrived, there was no toilet. But we had to use, so we had to dig our own hole. So we had no water, and the blood was running from our hands. And one girl, she got a little deeper and she fell. So we tried to pull her out. She was a short little, maybe 12 years old, maybe 30. She started to yell, don't take me, I want to die already, leave me alone here, leave me alone, let me die. But we pulled her out.
And here we are, we're standing in front of seven and a half tons of bones and ashes that the Russians found at the end of the war. שלום לכולם, הלב שלי שמח כאשר אני רואה פה יחודי, כאשר אני רואה פה נוער יחודי, היום בליינצוט אין יהודים בכלל, לכן כאשר פה באים יחודים, בית הכנסת קיים, כל זמן קיים. אוקיי, אז first of all, he isn't Jewish, and you should all be embarrassed of yourselves that he speaks Hebrew, אוקיי? and he's taught himself to read Hebrew, write Hebrew, and speak Hebrew in this room by himself. So that's the, okay, that's the one. Now, he says as follows, okay, he's very happy, number one, that he's here, uh, that you're all here. He says his heart is very happy today when he's uh, fulfilled, when he sees Jewish people coming back to Lanser. There are no Jews left in Lanser. He, today, is known as the last Jew of Lanser. Uh, even, okay? Justifying okay. to the fact that you, just like you were murdered there, and I saved you, these to fill in our testimony that you will wear forever as a nation. to show that I, as God, will take you out. And we're still wearing tefillin today. And we're still testifying today. And we are like tefillin today ourselves. So this is a monument to experience. Um, Isaac, where are you? I didn't know what to expect when going on this trip. I, first of all, didn't even expect I would even be accepted to this trip because I am from Vancouver, which is uh, not Toronto. And I just appreciate the warmth from everyone here, the community leaders, the organizers, and the people participating here. I've been nothing but blessed to live this and be a part of this. And I think we can all, we'll always look back, for example, on the rainbow at Treblinka. Wow. And, And to be here at your bar mitzvah, I feel like your, your father, I should say, Baruch Shev Tarani, Mount Shoshel Zeh. That's the traditional thing that a parent says, that you now take over the responsibilities that I carried for you. For my, my special grandson. יותר ממה שאפשר לבקש, לא רציתי להדאיג אותך מהכניסה לעזה או משהו. בבקשה, תהיי חזקה בשבילי. ואם יקרה לי משהו, תחייכי בגאווה, אני אוהב אותך, אוהב אותך. אוהב אותך, אוהב אותך, אוהב אותך, אוהב אותך. אבא, היית אבא נפלא באמת. אבא, גבר, גבר. למרות שרבנו בחודש האחרון, 
אל תייחס לזה משמעות, אני אוהב אותך הכי... And my wife answered Poland and she said, why are you going to Poland? And uh, uh, my wife said, you know, we're gonna, she's taking a trip and we're gonna, we're gonna learn about the Holocaust. And she said, uh, what, 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 what are you gonna, what happened? And uh, she said, she said, Talia said, uh, Nadida, my daughter's name, um, a lot of Jews, a lot of Jews died during the Holocaust. Um, a lot of Jews were killed. She says, why? Why? What do you answer to a seven-year-old? And you stand here, you want to say the Jews are they're rich, they do this, they do that, and you have reasons to kill them? With the children? You sat there in silence. What are you going to answer and tell a, tell a seven-year-old? How did humanity get to this point where you would look at a child and they do better off with a bullet in their head? Is there any positive that can come out of a place like this? Is how fortunate we are. Those of us that are blessed with children, to be able to raise them, to hug them, to kiss them, to nurture them, to educate them. What we're mourning here is the, the loss of potential. What could have been Jewish leaders, business people, strong representatives of the community, all that was snuffed out. Not a chance. It motivates me, it should motivate all of us to go home and see the potential in our children and motivate them to be the best that they can be. That'll be the biggest revenge that we can have. And they were coming at the end of the line and they were, looked very dirty and he did not like people that look dirty and somehow he sent them all to their death. We found out later on, I didn't hear anything, I didn't know I was a kid, but I found that we found out later on what happened. Those that went to the left were machine gunned. At that day, October 28, 1941, it is commemorated every year in Israel as the great action. 10,500 of our people were machine gunned to death. Can you imagine? It's, it's, it boggles the mind. But I think we have something in our psyche. We try to go on. We think maybe tomorrow will be better. And I still had, I was very lucky. I still had a mother and a, and I still had a mother and a father and a grandmother. So I was still very lucky. What happened? And I think you've heard of the word Ness, the Sinda Niflaot. I think what happened next was a real Ness. What happened? It was already 1943. I can stay here a whole night and tell you all kinds of things, but I have to move on. But I have to touch on 1943. Orders came out again that everybody should leave their homes. What happened at that day? It was the final solution of the Jewish people. And the final solution was take away the children and the old people are useless. How come I am standing right here? 
Somebody was watching over me. That day, when we were again forced to go out on the, uh, on, again on the, the, the democracy square, and again, we're going to be counted, they always had a pretext. I was away with my mother. My mother was a nurse. She was used all the time. She, anybody th that they needed her, even in the ghetto and outside, she was always used. What happened? My mother and father and men were sent that day a work detail to build the aerodrome away from the ghetto. And I remember my mother waking me and telling me that she has permission to take me with her. And I remember telling her that I am very tired and really very hungry, but if you knew my mother, you listened. <laughs> And I went that day to work in the trucks with all the men and my mother away, away from the ghetto, the aerodrome, to be, where planes are built. When we got back that night, it was the most horrible feeling. All the children and the old people were taken away. Fifty-two members of my family who were murdered in this place. We were in Maidan a couple of days ago, I told you about two of them. To think that 52 for my family, never mind that, but the 1.1 million is just an inconscionable number. Um, just show, share with you a couple of things. This is Judith, my grandmother's little sister, who was murdered here. This is her, her younger brother, Dov. This is her grandfather, who they were on the train together with, who we know that were murdered here 75 years ago on the 29th of May, which was just yesterday. The second day of Shavuot, they arrived here and they were murdered 75 years ago. That's her grandfather. Her mother, they were all on the train together. She was murdered here. My grandfather's mother, murdered here. My grandmother, grandmother and her five sisters and all of their families, murdered here. I'm just gonna read something that happened in this spot that we're standing in right now. After the war, my grandfather heard from an eyewitness who survived what exactly happened to his family in Auschwitz. His father was separated from his mother, his older sister Sarah, and her baby, baby son Ephraim, who was three years old. His mother was carrying the baby, and behind her was his sister. Sarah and this is a frame. His mother was carrying the baby and behind her was his sister who was 22 years old but looked much younger. When his mother holding the baby arrived in front of Dr. Mengele, he sent them to the left immediately to, the ga to be gassed. When his sister arrived in front of Mengele, he sent her to the right to work. When the baby started to cry, mommy, mommy, Dr. Mengele said to his sister in German, 
Is das dein Kind? Is this your child? She said yes. He couldn't believe it because she looked so young. But when she affirmed this again, then he said, then go with your child. This way, his mother, her sister, and her baby boy were sent immediately to be gassed. Maybe if the baby hadn't cried, Sarah would have survived. Who knows? This is, this is a horrific place. Keep them in your mind, please. Thanks for sharing. Right, we can... Do you know the original was stolen and it was returned in three pieces? Well, they found it in three pieces. The three pieces are there in the archives. And this, okay, is a, is a copy of what was here. But I've asked many survivors, tell me something. When you came into Auschwitz and you saw the gate, what did you know? What did you think? And actually, I have to tell you, the first survivor that told me that he remembered it was last week. Okay, uh, they remembered coming in and seeing the gate and wondering what it meant. But other survivors all tell me the same thing. Number one, I can bring many people back to Auschwitz, many survivors back to Auschwitz, and they say to me, I'm not sure we're in the right place. And I said, here we are. And so I said, well, I never saw this. Why? Because they saw Birkenau. They didn't see this. So many of our, of our Jewish families never came here, never walked through this gate, never saw it. Okay, and they never saw it. You never saw it either. Okay, so they never, never saw it. They went to Birkenau. Okay, not, not here. That's number one. Number two is people were so numb after getting off the train. What, they're really going to look at everything around them? They're going to from their families. They don't know where they are. Okay, and they come into this place over here. So when do they notice what was taking place here? And if you now look at the difference between the top and the bottom picture over here, you can see. When you see over here, you can see that they're clearly marching out of the gate. In the background, you can see there's a man with a baton. Okay, like this. He's behind that picture, that barrack over here. There was an orchestra over here, of course, that they used uh, in order to make sure that everyone marched uh, accordingly, number one. And number two is because the Germans are such cultured people, okay, they couldn't do anything without music at the time. Uh, that's number one. You can see over here, we've got the guy who's clearly the capo. Number one, he's wearing a K on him, so he's the capo. And number two is he's more well fed than everybody else. You can see him. He's keeping his group in order. But look at what's happening now. When you see the SS guard, you can see he's got his finger out. What's he doing? He's counting everybody. Okay, he's counting everyone. What, you haven't counted everybody already? Of course he has. He's done roll call already.
We're standing in Yeshiva's Chachmei Lublin. Uh, it's significant for the Jewish people because of what it represents. Some of the greatest of our Torah scholars in the 1930s studied through here. But uh, for me, it's, and I think what the living legacy means is that it's where my grandfather studied. So it's one thing to read about things in books and hear the stories. It's another thing to stand exactly where they were, to live a little bit of what they lived and to understand what that means and bring that back with you. This is a gift. I think it's a gift actually to me. And if I could say, it's probably a gift to my grandfather to know that I have the opportunity to learn with people here, to give sheer here, just like he sat and learnt and had his chavru says. I think the living legacy is all about finding a way to take what's theory and knowledge the Adata Hayom, you should know it today, but by Shevo Salavavecha, you gotta put that on your heart. My name is Jonathan Samuel. I came here with my wife Shauna, and we're here to pay respects to the murdered brothers of my grandfather, Julius and William, who were murdered here in Maidanek. I think it's incredibly important to come to a place like this where such horrible things have happened. this like unbelievable journey and experience I think for everyone here um, I didn't know what to expect when going on this trip I first of all didn't even expect I would even be accepted to this trip because I am from Vancouver which is uh, not Toronto and I just appreciate the warmth from everyone here the community leaders the organizers and the people participating here I've been nothing but blessed to live this and be a part of this and I think we can all We'll always look back, for example, on the rainbow at Treblinka. And that was something that we can carry forever and ever. And this is something we can also carry forever and ever. Because this isn't just my celebration. This is the celebration of the Jewish people, the Jewish nation. My name is Jessica Galfan, maiden name's Worth. And I'm here to honor my Bubby Ann as she is a survivor of Auschwitz. I'm standing here now in her barrack, right next to the bunk where she stayed during her time here. I've heard many stories throughout my life as a grandchild of a survivor and I've read many books but it wasn't until I walked into Poland and experienced this incredibly emotional journey over the past week that I've understood how challenging it was for them here and how much it makes a difference for us to come here and see what they went through in order to unite us as Jews. My name is Eli Benzakin. I'm here at uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau. Uh, it's all of our responsibility. It's our duty to be here, to come here. I didn't directly lose any family here, but my wife did and her family perished. I just want everybody to know it's our God-given responsibility to come here to honor those that we lost and to make sure that it never happens again. I'm Israel Chai. Amen. My name's Maddie Cherney and I'm from Toronto. Um, I came on the Living Legacy trip to learn about my Jewish identity and to feel connected with my family and I really have no words about where we are standing right now and I hate this place and um, and I I don't know what else to say about it, um, but I am really grateful that I'm here today and hearing all the stories from the survivors that are here with us and hearing stories about a lot of other survivors so that I'm able to pass them on to future generations. My name is Feige Libman. I'm a survivor from Kaunas, Lithuania, where I was born. I came here with the Asia Torah, group 
to show young people what really happened, that they should remember what hatred did, and we should all learn, and that we should never have any hatred, that we should all live together in peace. So this is my hope, that by people learning here, coming here, and they will see what really happened in Auschwitz. This is my third time here in Auschwitz-Birkenau, and it's an incredible honor to be able to come here and pay tribute to our fallen Jews, Jews of our nation who suffered tremendous calamity. So we come and we pay our respects, and you need to as well. You need to come and be a part of the Jewish nation, see your history, and experience it here with a survivor while we still can.